bottom one, this is important because we're going to talk about the Canaanite um, later. The bottom one right here, this was a sanctuary for the Canaanites. And we all know they were just found demonic in Jesus' name, right? Worshiping Baal, doing child sacrifice, doing all these orgies and perverse stuff up in the temple. Oh, yes. But it looks pretty. Oh, yes. It looks like it would have been a house of the true and only living God. But looks don't matter. It matters what's going on inside, right? All right. So let's go. Wow. Uh, to Numbers chapter 18, verse 3. And they shall keep thy charge, even the charge of all the tabernacle, but they shall not come near the instruments of the sanctuary, nor to the altar, lest they die, both they and you. So why would the Kohanim be charged with the Levites coming near and touching the sanctuary items. Well, because God has charged the Kohanim, the priests, the pastors, the bishops, wherever you are in the body of Christ, God has charged you with keeping the sanctuary sanctified. So when, come on now, when pastors, when bishops, when priests, when ministry leaders ministers i don't know whatever you are in the body of christ when you you who are supposed to be shepherding your flock allow sinny sin sin iniquities to come up into what's supposed to be a sanctuary of the most high god you have gone against a commandment of the lord you need to repent turn from this and go back to the house of God. You wonder why your towns or your cities and your state and your nation are falling to a demonic fallen world system? You, it's your fault. Look in the mirror. And I pray some of you are getting this con a spirit of conviction because I know some of you watch me. I know some of you do. But why do you do this then? My job is to go to these places and pray for people. And that's what I've been doing. And it's hard because there's a lot of witchcraft in those places. I'd be so exhausted after going to these churches. Some of them have, you know, more witches and warlocks in there and sorcery going on there than others. But some, mm, some of them have so much ego and pride and hurt and wounds that could all be healed if the pastors, the ministers, the bishops, the prophets, whoever they are in that house, I don't care, started holding each other accountable before you try to hold your flock accountable with your weird little covenant contracts. Hold yourself accountable first. Go back to the word of God and say, am I doing what God has told me to do? If not, apologize to God for him alone have you sinned against and correct yourself immediately go to your church family if they are really your family they'll understand and they'll see once you show them the word of god god will reveal to them he'll remove that scale and veils from their eyes and show them the truth there's nothing wrong with admitting that you had been taught wrong and you went astray and now you're going to correct yourself it's because of that dang on pride and ego that you don't mm. Mm -mm -mm. It's very sad. Oh, Father, forgive us. So, what instruments were in the sanctuary? Well, I'm glad you asked. All right, so the instruments that were in the sancti sanctuary that the Kohan Um and the Kohan Um Grandar were charged, ordered, commanded by our Father who is in heaven to keep sanctified and separate from the Levites were the items that were in the tabernacle itself the holy place and of course the holies of holies which only the kohanim grandar could go in there on the day of atonement right where the ark of the covenant was so i really like this little uh graft and list and the link is here for those who would like to look at it that whole um website or index has tons of maps and everything by the way very awesome um so here we go so the laver and the altar of sacrifice were the only two things, and the grounds, obviously, because they had to walk barefoot in there, were the only two things that the Levites were able to 
accidentally touch or assist the Kohanim Grandar with, right? Because they had to wash in the laver, they had to clean there, and then on the altar, um, the Levites would would help, you know, or whatever, put whatever up there. But it was the Kohanim who actually handed it off in there. The Levites would hand whatever sacrifice to the Kohanim. You know what I mean? They would help clean up and all that stuff. That was something different. But it was the Kohanim who performed the ceremony. So if the Levites accidentally touched the ramp or accidentally touched the levar, they weren't going to fall down and die there because it's their duty to help the Kohanim. But as far as going into where the menorah is, or it's a, it should be the lamp stand. People always confuse those two. Those are two different things. The menorah is for Hanukkah. The lamp stand is for the tabernacle. Um, the incense and then the table of showbread, that was for the Kohanim. Okay, the Kohanim dealt with all that inside. And then the Kohanim Grandar dealt with the Ark of the Covenant. All right. So I really like that uh, clip right there. And there's the link for those who would like to... Search that matter out on their own. All right. Verse 4 of Numbers chapter 18. And they shall join with thee and keep charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all of the service of the tabernacle, and no stranger shall come near unto you. Now, some different versions of the Bible say no alien. Um, and no, they're not talking about, you know, E.T. phone home or beam me up Scotty or something like that. Mm. What they are talking about is like no one who God has not approved, no one who is not of the Lord, no one who has um, been deemed unclean, no one who is not of the nation of Israel can just come up and walk up in the tabernacle and be touching all these items and make them unsanctified. That's what he means, right? All right. So here's another um, shot of stranger for those because normally people like to mix these words. So stranger has two different terms and we have to understand the context of it. So there were foreigners who lived among the Israelites. They joined the nation of Israel when Israel left Egypt. Those would be the new convert strangers, right? Then there were strangers who were living in the desert at the time the nation of Israel was living and wandering the desert. And let's say someone from another nation was like, wow, I see your God is a true God in I see his presence is upon you. Now, I don't know your God. I don't serve your God, but I feel his power. I feel his glory. And I like, I would like to provide a sacrifice according to his laws at uh, your tabernacle. Well, someone, someone who, a stranger in that sense, who served other gods before, if he wanted to come and make an offering unto the true living God, he could. And I know that seems so wrong to people, but as long as he did it according to God's laws, then God allowed it because God was going to use that experience to work on him and kind of get him converted, right? Amen. Kind of like when you bring a sinny sin downright sinner to church. Same thing. <laughs> All right. Then there were foreigners who were uh, conquered and they were going to get circumcised. And then they were going to get forcibly <laughs> um, taken over and they were going to be forced to join the na nation of Israel, which didn't always work. Um, those unnaturalized um, aliens were not allowed to come into the temple until they married into the nation and fully committed themselves to the true living God, if that makes sense. All right. So stranger would be better described in a couple of different senses the sojourner means the wandering the traveler who just noticed how god is amazing and wants to give an offering according to god's law the stranger the new convert over to 
uh, Christianity or Judaism. And then the foreigner, the one who had been captured, now they're living amongst the Jews and the Hebrews and they are uh, working off being a slave and they are required to serve the Lord our God while they're still a slave of a Hebrew or Jew. Amen? All right. Numbers chapter 18, verse 5. Therefore shall ye keep the charge of the sanctuary and charge of the altar, so there shall be... Huh, excuse me. Therefore ye keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, so there shall fall no more wrath upon the children of Israel. So right there, this Bible verse says it plain and clear. Therefore shall ye keep the charge of the sanctuary, meaning it's your job, priests, prophets, saints, pastors, ministers, wherever you are in the body of Christ, whatever your ministry is, it's your job to ensure that sanctuary is indeed sanctified and separated from the world and not doing all these pagan ungodly things because if not wrath comes upon the children of israel wrath comes upon your cities wrath comes upon your towns your states your nation why because of you because of you you are the key to it all when righteousness lives Listen to me. Where righteousness lives, evil cannot dwell. For the Spirit of the Lord is there in Jesus' name. But the minute that the gatekeeper, which is the pastor, the priest, the minister, the bishop, wherever you are in the body of Christ, allows pagan, idolatry, slanderers, gossip, and, and you, you are just passive, you know what's going on, but you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings because I get that you love them. But sometimes love needs to rebuke some people in Jesus' name. Amen. There's nothing wrong with saying, look, uh, you gossip a lot. I think you might have a gossiping spirit. I need to pray for you. We're going to pray together. You know? Or, hey, we're not going to celebrate any of these pagan, demonic holidays anymore because God has been really dealing with my spirit on this. Amen? There's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just like a bunch of individuals just don't have the courage to do so. They're afraid of offending someone and if someone honestly really loved you and really loved that church that they're volunteering or working at as much as they say they do, going by the word of God shouldn't it offend them. <laughs> That shouldn't make them upset. That shouldn't make them want to leave that church. And if someone wants to go because you want to follow the word of God and they don't, say, I'll pray for you while you are out there. Come back when you're ready to love the Lord in Jesus' name. Like the prodigal son or daughter will be waiting for you with a coat of many colors when you're done. Amen? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh father god help us number chapter 18 verse 6 for lo i have taken your brother and the levites from among the children of israel which as a gift of yours to the kohanim are given unto the lord and do the service of the tabernacle of congregation so they help during the services to service the kohanim gondar but thou meaning Aaron, and thy sons, meaning the sons, two remaining sons of Aaron and their descendants, with these shall your priest's office, the office of the priesthood, come on now, for all these things of all the altar within the veil, therefore shall ye serve, for I have made your priest's office an office of service, therefore the stranger that cometh near shall be slain. In Jesus' name. And this is a righteous slaying. It is a slaying of the Lord. I pray right now in Jesus' name. All those who are not serving the Lord. Who are trying to come against those who truly love the Lord. All those pastors who are trying to do right. But you don't have support from your congregation. I pray right now they be sent away from your church. I pray right now in Jesus' name. All those who are, who are coming against you. 
all those who are talking you out of living and doing God's word, all those who are speaking lies and deceit and all those witches and those warlocks coming and casting spells in your church, Lord, I rebuke them right now in Jesus' name. Uh Uh-uh. I pray they, they can't even come within 20 miles of your church ever again, Lord. I pray that your church becomes a true sanctuary of the Lord. And as you grow deeper and deeper in Christ, Lord, may more righteous, more righteous congregation just fill your church, Lord. And then the presence of God, presence of God will dwell there forever, forever more. For the next 100, 400, 500, 700 years and more. Amen in Jesus' name. Praise God. Okay, so the definition of responsibility, account- accountability, and dereliction of duty. Now, dereliction for, of duty is a military term. And if you are in the body of Christ, you are part of the legion, the army of Christ. So this is why I feel these definitions apply to this Bible study, specifically the charge or command of our Father for the priests, the ministers, the Bible studies, the children's ministry, the um, praise and worship team, the offerings, wherever you are, the security. We all have responsibilities, accountabilities, and if we don't do them, we are in dereliction of duty. Definition responsibility. A state of quality or a fact of being responsible, a duty or obligation that one is responsible for, an expense, a debt, a financial burden that one must pay, the amount of such expense or debts and a financial burden. Oh yes, 100%. We are accountable to God and we should rejoice in that accountability. We should thank God every day like, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for deeming me worthy. Hallelujah. I feel that so strongly. For deeming me worthy and calling me to be accountable to you. Because I am yours and you are more than my father. You are my lordship. You are my boss. You are my king. Hallelujah. What a beautiful job to serve the Lord. Next, when you have a responsibility, when you don't carry out that responsibility, well, you come under accountability, right? You are expected or required to account for one's actions answerable, capable of being explained or accountable phenomenon. Now, when we don't hold the charge of our office, for which we are accountable for, we might fall under dereliction of duty. What is this? Dereliction of duty generally refers to a failure to conform to the rules of God for one's job. If you are in the priesthood, God clearly gives us many, many rules, right? Which will rarely be task involved. God gives us all task, priests, saints of God, it is a failure or a refusal to perform assigned duties in the satisfactory manner. Dereliction of duty on the part of an employee may cause for a disciplinary action for which will rarely be by the employer. Where our employer is Jesus, right? <laughs> our employer, our boss is God. And when we aren't living up to the standards of our duties that God has tasked us with, we can get reprimanded or we can get removed from that office. We can get reprimanded until we come into correction. We can have a lot of things happen to us. And I pray, I do, yes, yes ma'am and yes sir. I pray in Jesus name that those who are under this dereliction of duty i do pray god reprimands you and disciplines you not because i don't love you no 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 because i do love you and god 
rebukes those who he loves. God corrects his children who he loves. So if I see God correcting you, I know it's because God loves you. Because God corrects me all the time. I'm like, oh, praise Yahweh. You love me so much, Lord. <laughs> oh, you're so merciful, God. You correct me. Praise Yahweh. You love me, right? But when God corrects us, it gives us a chance to come into repentance, turn away from whatever we weren't doing right with God. And then it gives us so many beautiful opportunities to get right with God. It's, it's a blessing when you think about it. It is a blessing to fall into the hands of our father and say, Abba, I was so wrong, Lord. Oh, forgive me. Please show me how I may correct this and do right by you, Lord. I know this is of my own, my own work because I went against you, Lord. Thank you for being so merciful and good and giving me a chance to fix this, Lord. Praise you now and forever. And then God, ask God for guidance. He'll say, go back to my word, most likely. And then you go by God's word and say, this is what you want me to fix. I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it right now. And then in correcting, you're showing your faith. You're offering a sacrifice. You're repenting. You're fasting on evil ways. Soon, those spiritual and soul attachments will leave. The house of the Lord will be restored. God's presence will be able to dwell there again. Yes. I do. I pray in Jesus' name that God brings all these houses to correction. I do. I think it's a blessing. Some might be like, oh, Marie, that's not nice. <laughs> but um, I'm sorry, you're wrong. It's, it's a good thing to be corrected by God. Better to be corrected by God than by man, right? Because <laughs> God loves us. <laughs> all right. So the link below is to many live and recorded Bible studies this season, which can review uh, verses 18, chapter 18, verse 7. But thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office of all things of the altar within the veil, and therefore shall ye serve, for I have made your priest's office an office of service. Therefore the stranger that cometh near shall be slain. So in season um, chapter 14, 15 sorry ah, season 4 September 15th we begin this uh, fourth season of the Bible study so right there at this playlist it went over all the laws that God had initially given the priests on upon uh, constructing the tabernacle so that what that playlist is all right okay so essentially God Almighty is stating no unauthorized person is to come into or near the sanctuary upon charge of death. God commands what share of offerings next and sacrifices shall be for the Kohanim, which the Kohanim again is the head of the Levitical priesthood that are in line to be the high priest of the tabernacle. They are the only ones, right? And you know why? Our Jesus, he is part of this holy priesthood. He is part of um, the Kohanims. He's the only one who is qualified to be the high priest of the tabernacle and our king, our ruler from Judah. Isn't that beautiful? Um, so that's why I believe it's important to separate the Levites and the Kohanim. Because according to, since we are all priests now because of Jesus, we're all the Levites. <laughs> okay? Um, so to speak, so to speak, uh, spiritually. If you are a priest or a leader in the body of Christ, spiritually speaking, you are in the office of the priesthood the Levites. Okay. And it's our job to assist the Kohanim. Um, the Kohanim, the high priest of the tabernacle, are Jesus. So I hope that makes sense. You should consider it a really good, a really great and beautiful honor and go out and do the best to serve our Father who is in heaven. All right. Numbers chapter 18, verse 8. Again, the Lord spoke unto Moses. Aaron, <laughs> Moses, behold, I have given thee the keeping of mine offering and all the hallowed things of the children of Israel. 
Unto thee I have given them for the anointing sake, and thy sons for a perpetual ordinance. How long is perpetual? Forever and ever. As long as that bloodline is rolling. I do believe there are still um, the descendants of Aaron still out there. That would be amazing. I'm not saying they would take the place of our high priest or Jesus, but I do believe there are Kohanims out there. I think it would be amazing to meet one. That'd be awesome. This shall be thine of the most holy things reserved from the fire, all their offerings and all their meat offerings and their sin offerings and all their trespass offerings, which bring unto me, that shall be most holy unto me and thy sons so these whole um offerings holy offerings of verse 9 are the ones that uh would be partially offered to uh, the kohanams the most holy place shall thou eat it every male shall eat of it it is holy unto thee also shall be thine the heave offering of thy gift and all the shake offerings of the children of Israel, I have given them unto thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee to be a duty forever and all the clean of thy house shall eat of it. So in worry, all the trespass offerings. Here we go. The other offerings that are listed here, the heave offerings and their gift, now, this is the offerings that the households of the Kohanim can eat. Even those who are ritually clean in the house can eat it. Like if the slaves are ritually clean, or the housemaids, or the manservants, they can eat of it as well. All the fat of the oil, and all the fat of the vine, and the wheat which they shall offer, Unto the Lord for their first fruits I have given unto them, given them unto thee. And the first ripe of all this in thy land, and shall bring unto the Lord, and shall thine, and all the clean of thy house shall eat of it. Everything separate from the common verse in Israel shall be thine. All the first openeth of the mat matrix, same word, of any flesh, meaning um, matrix, the womb, the uterus, the birth, the firstborn, uh, cattle, which they shall offer unto the Lord of the man or beast shall be thine. But the firstborn of a man shall thou redeem, and the firstborn of the unclean beast shall thou redeem. So right here, when they say, but the firstborn of the man shall thou redeem, that is the offering back of your child back to God um, in a dedication ceremony where they do the sprinkling of the waters some misquote it and say baptism it's not a it's not a baptism um, I know some religions say it's a baptism but basically when you do a sprinkling of the waters on a child you're you're doing what God has commanded you to do you're offering back your child to the service of God. For God is only loaning you that child while they are here on earth. They are under your care, under your covenant of parenthood. So on the eighth day for the male children, they would go and they would have their circumcision. But they would also do the washing or the sprinkling of the child, whatever you want to say it. There was some dunking of the water. Some of them were sprinkled. And um, the Nazarite children, I believe, were sprinkled. And the other children, I believe, they were dunked. So, to each their own, right? Um, both, both were priesthoods unto the Father. They were dedicated to the tabernacle for service to our Lord. Like with Samson, right? And like with Samuel. And, of course, most famous, our Jesus. <laughs> so... I try to make that clear when some people are just uh, religion, uh, religionistic, if that's a word, about it, about um, you're not supposed to baptize a child. They're supposed to, 
get baptized when they're adult. And yes, that's absolutely true. But it is a requirement as ordered by God, our Father, for parents to dedicate their children if you want your child to live a priestly, uh, blessed life and be offered to back to your father while you are here on earth for him to be under I guess an extra uh, hedge of protection from our father with more angels assigned to them for it's written in his word of God then you offer back your child to God because he's the one who gave him you that child in the first place amen all right so that's why it says this but the firstborn of man thou redeem amen and the firstborn of the unclean beast thou shalt redeem. And those that are in the to be redeemed shall to redeem for the age of a month. Amen. According to thy estimation for the money of five shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary and twenty garnas. Right here. Right here. All these together. Redeem your child. Go. Go redeem your child right now. Dedicate your child to the Lord. I'm not saying you have to go to a tabernacle and do it. I'm not saying you have to go to a meeting place. You can do this at home. It started in the household. Amen. I believe each and every one of us is God's children. If you have parents, you go pray over your little one right now. And they're sleeping. And you dedicate your child to the service of our Father who is in heaven. Marie, have you done this? Yes. And believe it or not, I see a difference in parents who I know have done this for their kids and parents who I know have not done this for their children. There is a difference I have seen in adults who have been baptized and adults who have not been baptized. Amen. In both cases, they were Christians. There was someone I knew who, um, they were not baptized in an adult. Um, and they are just, it's sad. And, you know, you got to pray for them. But then there's our others, you know, they come back to Christ. They get re-baptized. And it's, it's amazing how God just works in them. So, yes, there is something to this. Amen. At least that I have seen. But, of course, always confirm with God. Numbers chapter 18, verse 17. But the firstborn of the cow and the firstborn of the sheep and the firstborn of the goat shalt thou not redeem, for they are holy. Thou shalt sprinkle their blood at the altar and thou shalt burn their fat. It is a sacrifice made by fire, a sweet savor to the Lord. The first of them shall be thine as a, as a shake breast and the right shoulder should be thine shall be thine excuse me all the heave offering of the holy things which the children of israel shall offer unto the lord i have given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee and to be a duty forever and this perpetual perpetual forever never ending going round and round again and again covenant of salt <laughs> which never goes bad hallelujah mm. I love the covenant of salt. Praise God. <sighs> Before the Lord to thee and thy seed with thy with thee forever and ever in Jesus name. Amen. The Kohanim are to receive and consume what is holy including God's kingdom. Nothing of earth will be of an inheritance for them. Instead of a temporary luxury or possessions, God's gift the Kohanim everything eternal verse 20 of numbers chapter 18 and the lord said unto aaron thou shalt have none inheritance in their land see how god separates that i love this jesus said this all the time too jesus went to speak in their synagogues right because those synagogues weren't of the lord <laughs> It makes me think how many churches today God would be like, well, I'll guess Jesus will go and teach in their churches, right? See, when Jesus is in there, the Spirit of God is in there, he claims it. He's like, those are mine. But <laughs> when he ain't dwelling there, 
it is theirs. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance of their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am the part and in thine inheritance among the children of Israel. And I know that sounds odd to many because God loves the children of Israel. God loves the nation of Israel. They are his firstborn of the firstborn nation, right? Um, the Levites are the firstborn of the firstborn nation. And then the Kohanim are the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn nation. The apples, apples of his eyes, right? So why is there this separation? Well, because there's the level of spirituality like we talked about. And I know some are going to be like, oh, we're all the body of Christ. Yes. But let me tell you right now. Never, ever, ever will you see an eyeball get into your shoe and help you walk around. It does not work that way. Never, ever, ever will you see your kneecap jump into your elbow and help you lift something. It don't work that way. Every part of the body has its purpose. So when you know what part of the body you are, you go and do your job. You don't worry about what the other part of the body is doing. You run your race in Jesus' name. If you don't know what part you are in the part of the body of Christ, go and ask God, for he's the one who puts the body together. Amen? Praise God. So when God says, Aaron, I'm your inheritance. Ooh, how beautiful it is to have nothing on this earth. It makes me look at, I'm just going to say it, and I, I pray others receive it the way I intend it. When I look at or hear about third world nations and how first world nations are, are going in to quote unquote help them, part of me is like, leave them alone. They don't have to worry about electricity. It doesn't matter to them if the electricity goes out. They know how to survive off the land the way God intended. They know how to make their clothes, make their medicines from what God intended. Leave them alone. Don't go give them your bags of rice and your bags of beans, beans with your GMOs and make them sick. And before they were living to be almost 153 jubilees like we're supposed to. And now because you think you know better based off of your first world mindset of what a good living is. Now you've gone over there and corrupted them when they were doing more than fine without our help. Leave them alone in Jesus name. There's no doubt in my mind that those third world nations, those tribes that are out there still running around living off the land, they have it far better than us in the world, first world world. They don't have to worry about ridiculous social media. They don't have to worry about ridiculous trends and, and keeping up with the Joneses. They might have their own set of troubles, but I can guarantee you, I believe they're far right with God than we are. That's just my thinking. I think they are the ones who are really truly blessed the more and more oh, I'm not gonna cry the more and more I think about it I think they are truly blessed and I know someone just to be ridiculous they'll bring up you know some place that's having famine and all that stuff obviously those places are cursed <laughs> but there's some lands out there that you just know God's beautiful presence is there and Man, I don't say this negatively. I mean a positive God. I kind of envy them now. Looking at how good they must have it being that close to God. It must be something truly beautiful. Because here in these cities, with all this craziness and lawlessness and... So far from God, so far from what God intended it to be. It's really actually sad. But that's just my point of view. <laughs> Amen. All right. 
Uh, where were we? All right, yeah. Verse 21 of Numbers chapter 18. For behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth of Israel for an inheritance for their service, which they serve in the tabernacle of congregation. Neither shall the children of Israel any more come near to the tabernacle of congregation, lest they sustain sin and die. So the children, meaning only the Levites and the Kohanim, were allowed to go to the tabernacle. Prior to this, remember, the children of Israel, the whole nation, were able to bring up their offerings and God welcomed them in and they were in there and they were eating and they were giving to, to the Lord. But when, oh, it's so sad, when the nation of Israel fell, they fell spiritually into iniquity and sin where they couldn't even be close to the presence of God, let alone in the presence of God. You see what I'm saying? Oh, that's so sad. That's so very sad. They had it so good. <laughs> they had it so good and they just threw it all away. Mm, all for some murmuring and some rebellion, huh? <laughs> some leeks and some cucumbers like they were saying. Oh, Father, forgive us. But the Levites, but the Levites, verse 23, number chapter 18, but the Levites shall do the service at the tabernacle of the congregation and shall bear their sin. It is the law forever. How long is forever? Forever. In your generation. And what generations? Their generations. So is this till they get to the promised land or is this until the last generation of the last Kohanim and Levite? ever i don't know i guess we'll find out for now i'm just gonna assume for right now it's until right here the end of time because i believe until our jesus comes back we are always supposed to take care of the sanctuary because even our jesus says to peter do you love me peter <laughs> and peter says lord you know everything you know all feed my sheep peter Teach my sheep, Peter. Love my sheep. Feed my sheep. Right? Mm, mm, mm. How can we be doing what Jesus and God has commanded us if we're feeding them molded, stale bread? Bread that's been offered to these witches and warlocks. Grape juice that is uh, filled with a bunch of chemicals and dyes. Does that sound right? And, and it, obviously the moldy bread and chemical and dyed juice is, is just a metaphor. But we're supposed to keep that sanctuary clean. That's our job. To love God's sheep. They're God's flock. We just get to hang out with them from time to time. But God, if we are doing right by God, you know, He's dwelling with them. So when we don't do right by God, we're cheating. We're cheating his people from his presence. And that's a terrible thing. It's sad. It, it's... I don't understand. I really don't. Because there's so many well-meaning and well-educated pastors and priests I see all the time and and I just wonder why why are you why are you doing this <laughs> especially when it came around Halloween time why are you doing this I'll say this though the only church I volunteer at is the only church I found when I was looking around that they didn't celebrate anything with Halloween they didn't do a trunk or treat they didn't do a harvest festival they were the only one and I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. Finally, finally, Lord, a church that loves you, God. I felt so, I do feel so blessed. And that's why I like going there. And I love volunteering there because they're the only church that didn't do that, that I saw. I was very proud of them with God, you know, it was nice nice experience anyhow for the tithes of the children of israel which they shall offer as an offering unto the lord i have given the levites for an inheritance therefore i have said unto them among the children of israel 
ye shall possess none inheritance. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the also unto the Levites, and say to them, When ye shall take of the children of Israel's tithes, I have given you for them your inheritance, then shall ye take a heave offering at the same for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And this is where they give a tithe, that one tenth of your income or whatever is supposed to go. Um, that is an Old Testament thing. And I, and I think even in Jesus' time, they would give an offering. And, and actually, I, I want to say, let me correct myself, I saw two, right? They did a tithe and then they did an offering for like... When you were healed, you went according to the law of Moses and did your offering and stuff like that, right? But in the New Testament times, you're supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit, which I think is a beautiful thing because there's a lot of people who give more than they're tied when they're led by the Holy Spirit. Um, and the Holy Spirit will guide someone in the spirit of truth of what they're supposed to give. So if you're going to you know, a place that the spirit of the Lord ain't dwelling there and the Lord tells you to only give a dollar, only give a dollar. If the Lord tells you to give nothing, don't give anything. If the Lord tells you to give, you know, whatever amount plus a little bit more, then that's the Lord leading because the Lord knows everything. I'm just saying, I don't believe in just a tithe. Um, I believe we should give God 90% of our lives. And most of our money is supposed to go to um, the priesthood of God. And then the rest is for us and our family. Not that we're not supposed to take care of our housely affairs and stuff like that. That's not what I mean. I mean it like this. You take care of your household, right? Well, your household is your covenant with God. So you are taking care of God's ministry there. You are in the covenant of marriage. Okay, so you're taking care of that covenant there. You covenant of parenthood. Okay, you're taking it there. You have charge to take care of your animals. Okay, you're taking care of it there. Then, well, where do you where are you fed spiritually? Do you have home Bible studies? Do you go to a church? Okay, then you have to give part of that there. So that's what I believe. You take 90% of it, take out your household stuff, freely divide it, and then 10% is for going out to eat movies vacation i don't know that's what i believe others might see it differently but um to each their own in jesus name amen always confirm with god i shouldn't say to each their own you know go and confirm with god that's just what i believe i do my best to give god 90 percent because god is my king and yeah, I don't, I don't know how else to explain it, but I love God so much. I owe him everything. Amen and amen. All right. Verse 27, Numbers chapter 18. And your heath offering shall be reckoned unto you as the corn of the barn or the as the abundance of the winepress. So ye shall offer an heath offering unto the Lord of all your tithes. Which ye shall receive of the children of Israel, ye shall give therefore to the Lord's heave offering to Aaron and the priests. Ye shall offer to all your gifts to the Lord heave offering, and all the fat of the same. Excuse me, I needed to drink some juice. Shall ye offer the holy things thereof. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, When you have offered the fat thereof then it shall be counted unto the levites as an increase of the corn of the f of the floor flour sorry as the increase of the wine press ye shall eat it in all places ye in your households for it is your wages for your service of the tabernacle see that's what I believe if you do a good job serving the lord you don't have to worry about anything now you can have an earthly abundance or you can have a heavenly abundance. Me personally, I rather have a heavenly abundance. I will say this. I know I don't look like much in my eyes. I get that, right? But I've noticed this um, a couple of years ago 
maybe three years ago now about the second season of the Bible study. When I started going into churches, people looked at me different. Now, I was wearing the same type of clothes I had always been wearing. I hadn't really changed much. I, I lost a little bit of weight, but people were looking and treating me different. Now, I can tell you right now, the only thing that changed about me is at that point, I had fully given my life over to Christ. That's the only thing. Now, when you have the presence of the Lord with you wherever you go, I don't know how it is done. I know it's supernaturally. I know it's spiritually. I know this. People see you and they can sense God's spirit upon you. And they think all these things about you in the worldly sense. Oh, are they rich? Oh, did they used to model? Oh, did they, they used to be famous? What? There's something about them that stands out. And they should know it's the presence of the Lord that's upon you. They're trying to figure everything out, but it's the spirit of the Lord. And it's, I think it's really kind of funny when people will be like, what do you do? There's something about you. And I said, oh, I do Bible studies online. They're like, oh, and they just look at me like, okay. And some of them are so confused about it. And I know, well, I feel I know I should say that. I feel God leads me to know that what they're wondering about is what is it about me that makes me stand out? And I can tell you right now, I, I'm not like extremely good looking. I'm not that. I'm not eloquent. I'm not a lot of things that I guess a lot of people have been trained worldly wise to look highly upon. But I do know this. When I go somewhere, the Spirit of the Lord goes with me. And that is the only thing that makes me stand out. And that's not boasting on myself. That's on the Lord. That's the Lord's glory. That's the Lord's credit. That's the Lord's righteousness. And I say that to, to share this with others. When others see you, they should see something that resembles God. No sin, <laughs> you know, not perfection. We're not perfect. But they should see that you are part of God's congregation wherever you go. Amen? Amen. And it's, I don't know, it's just funny. I think it's wonderful. I think it's funny, especially when other pastors see me and they're like, there's something, you know, they look at me kind of weird. I'm like, oh, hi, how are you doing? And it's just, it's God. And I don't know how, how to explain to them because in my mind, they should know. Anyhow. All right. Numbers chapter 18, verse 32. And they shall bear no sin for the reason of it. When ye have offered the fat of it, neither shall ye pollute the holy things of the children of Israel, Israel lest ye die. Amen. Praise God. All right. So now we're going to get into the spiritual teaching of the Bible study and where are we and we do have a Torah reading today at the end from first Samuel from chapter 11 to chapter 12 so as always as I go over the Torah part of the teaching I only go over the Bible verses that the Lord our God pointed out to me to avoid redundancy and then we will go over our uh, first Samuel readings for the Haft, Haftoras Korach. Okay, all right. Here we go. Father God, thank you for this spiritual teaching. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your leadership and guidance. Thank you that you are the creator and sovereign ruler of all things. In Jesus' name we pray, always and forever. Amen. Verses 1 through 7. God reiterated the command that both Aaron and the Levites had the responsibility for protecting the tabernacle from trespassers, as well as a responsibility of the protecting of what has been sanctified within the tabernacle. Verse 2. The Levites were made to be consoled and not to be excluded 
from assisting with the duties of the tabernacle. The rebellion of the previous Levites pushed upon Moses and Aaron was not to be held against the Levites who did not rebel. The ones who remained were given credit for their loyalty. With these Bible verses, it is confirmed and welcomed a charge of ministry, singing of psalms, and acting as watchmen of the treasuries and being treasure officials of the tabernacle. Verse 3. Holy vessels. Holy vessels were not to be touched. The ark, the table, the menorah or candlestick to be more precise, the gold altar and the reforming from taking a part in the saint of saint <laughs> sacrificial service of the outer courts. Verse 5. Clarification to the 70 elders or Sanhedrin were to keep a charge of safeguarding the holy and holy and oh here we go holy and the altar the Sanhedrin the 70 elders were to keep everything sanctified for the holy and the altar so no more wrath would come against the children of israel verse 6 further stated even after the rebellion by some of the levites were present as servants of the kohanim only for the service of god god makes it clear that the levites the kohanim people in authority should respect the dignity of their underlings, the Levites. They should be supervised in their work, but not intimidated into becoming personal servants. Verse 10. Most assume the term most holies referred to the inner chamber of the sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant rests. But here the most holies is referred to the tabernacle courtyard, the only place where the Kohanim may eat the sanctif sanctif sacrificial <laughs> portions mentioned in the above Bible verses. What makes this location of the tabernacle most holy is and are the holy things of the high holy offerings. Verse 11. The waving offering or parts of peace, thanksgiving, and Nazarite offerings may be eaten by the Levite camp in the wilderness or in the temple area within the walls of Jerusalem. Verse 18. The Kohanim receive the complete offering of the firstborn offering, not just the portion as with the other offerings. Verse 19. A salt, a salt covenant. Salt never spoils. God tells the Kohanim he has a salt covenant with them it is eternal. Hallelujah. Verse 20. The Kohanim don't get a portion of the land, but also will not share in the spoils of war against the Canaanite, Canaanite nations. Verse 23. If the Israelites commit a sin of trespassing on the tabernacle, the Levites will be held responsible, for they have been assigned to guard the sacred premises. Verse 30. Once the one-tenth, the Kohanim portion of the offering, was separated, the remaining nine-tenths of the offering, the Levites kept is not considered sanctified. Verse 32. A Kohanim will be punished if ever a Kohanim offers turmah 
a holy sanctification to any offering as a buying of holiness, buying or selling forgiveness, buying or selling religious relics, Re religions who sell forgiveness go against God's word. Priests should perform God's duty without expecting or demanding anything in return. Praise to the living God. Amen. All right, let me scroll down a second and we will get to our reading of 1 Samuel. Mm, excuse me, drinking some juice. 1 Samuel, um, parts of chapter 11 and parts of chapter 12. And certain readings after reading of the Torah are required. Now, I don't know all the occasions. I only know some of them. And blessings be to God, I have the Blue Stone Torah, which gives me a note to do so and when to do so and what to read. So that's what I'm reading from right here in Jesus' name. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 14. Praise God now and forever. Amen. Father God, thank you for giving us your Torah. Hallelujah. Thank you for giving us your written word. Thank you for giving us your spoken word. Thank you for giving us your inspired word. Thank you for opening your mind and your hearts out to us each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, always and forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I felt like God held the music so we could do that prayer. <laughs> I love you, Lord. Amen. All right. <laughs> That's so cute. I love that. All right. Okay. And Samuel said to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew there the kingdom. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made King Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they slaughtered peace offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the people rejoiced greatly. And Samuel said to all, Israel, behold, I have hearkened to your voice, and everything which you have said to me, I have made a king to reign over you. And now, behold, the king is walking before you. I have become old and hoary, honorary, and my sons are here with me, and I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am bearing witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox I did take, and whose ass did I take, and whom did I rob, whom did I oppress, for those whom hand did I take ransom, that I hid my eyes therewith, and shall I restore you? And they said, You did not rob us, nor did you oppress us, neither did you take anything from anyone's hand. And then he said to them, The Lord is a witness against you, and his anointed is a witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, He is witness. And Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who made Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. And now stand, and I shall reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts which he did to you and your forefathers. When Jacob came to Egypt and your forefathers cried out to the Lord, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, and they brought your forefathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this land. And they forgot the Lord. Oh, that's so sad. And they forgot the Lord your, their God, and they de he delivered them into the hand of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazar, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hands of Moab, and they waged war with them. They cried to the Lord and said, We have sinned, we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balaam and Ashtar. Now save us from the hand of our enemies, and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel, and he saved you from the hand of your enemies round about, and you dwelt in safely. And when you saw 
Nahash, the king of Ammon, come upon you, you said to me, No, but the king shall rule over us when the Lord your God is your king. And now behold the king whom you have chosen, whom you have requested, and behold the Lord has appointed a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him, and hearken to his voice, you will not, and you will not rebel against the commandments of the Lord. Both you and the king who reigns over you will be after the Lord your God. But if you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord, and you will rebel against his commandments of the Lord, and the Lord's hand will be against you and against your fathers. Even now, stand and see this thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I shall call to the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your evil is great, what you have done in the eyes of the Lord, to ask yourselves a king. And Samuel calls to the Lord, Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord our God, and let us not die, for we have added to all our sins evil to ask ourselves for a king. And Samuel said to the people, Fear not, you have done all this evil, but do not turn aside from following the Lord, and you shall serve the Lord with all your heart. And you shall not turn aside from then, you will not go after vain things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his peoples for his great name's sake. So the Lord has shown to make you a people for himself. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, children of the Most High, ever-loving, living God, I pray others got something out of this Bible study. I pray it bless others in Jesus' name. Thank you for celebrating my earthly birthday with me. Um, I truly have had such a wonderful time this evening. And to me, there's no pla other place I'd rather be than sharing and studying the word of God and praying and calling others to love the Lord and to seek his face and recommit our churches, our households, ourselves, our lives to God's kingdom. Some of us need to recommit every day, right? Some of us, it's it's been a season and we need to jump back into loving the Lord some of us, it might, that season might have turned into decades. I believe, I believe because I believe God has grace for us all who, who want to come back, you know, who have been misled or gone astray. I believe this is a great season of miracles. I truly do. And I believe this is a great season of grace. And I truly pray for others in Jesus' name. Just come back to the Lord. Come running. Come running like a prodigal son with your arms wide open saying, Abba, Abba, let me back into your household for even your slaves eat better than I do. Amen. God is so merciful and good. I do believe. I want to believe. Obviously, I don't speak for God on this matter. But I do believe God will be like, okay, come back. Let's let's try this again. You know? <sighs> I'm praying for everyone. And I pray others will pray for me because we all need prayer. We all need our Jesus. We're all we all got something. <laughs> As I like to say, we all got something we need to get over. But let's close this out with a pray in prayer and honestly thank you from the bottom of my god-fearing heart thank you for being with me on um you know my birthday celebrating this i won't say how old i am <laughs> but i will say thank you because it's honestly been a true pleasure serving the lord amen 
Father God, in the blessed name of our Jesus Christ of Nazareth, thank you for this day. Thank you for being with us and leading and guiding us. And thank you for your love, your kindness, and your mercy. Thank you for giving us time with you, Lord, to search and repent. And, and thank you for calling us to come back to you, Lord, calling us to come back and, and consider your law, your ways, your heart, your mind. Consider not the things that are of this world. Consider what you intended from the very beginning. Consider what you wanted things to be like and how, unfortunately, we have lined on our own understanding in our own ways and we may have confused our relationship with you with religion with culture with common practices we have done things that were against you and we weren't supposed to do god for those churches that are coming back to you and repenting and turning over and turning away from sin and turning away from all these ungodly celebrations lord i thank you for for inspiring them to come to you and serve you with a humble giving heart lord i pray and i thank you for guiding them i thank you for sending your ministering angels onto them lord i thank you for saving them that their buildings won't be destroyed and won't fall, Lord. And I thank you for saving them and their congregation. I thank you for saving them and all who that congregation serves and the community that congregation serves, Lord. And I thank you for healing those lands. I thank you for restoring each and every one of them and their members to full godly health. I thank you for removing any bloodline or ancestral curses in Jesus' name. I thank you for removing any cops from their ears and any veils and scales from their eyes and any fogginess from their mind, Lord. I thank you for giving them a new zeal, a cup that overflows with the joy of the Lord and the blessings pouring out of the windows, windows of heaven that no one can contain. I pray that as they grow in their new relationship and new covenant with you, Lord, that others see the blessing of the Lord and how good serving the Lord righteously and according to his true word can be and that it inspires other churches to dive back into your word of God and recommit themselves to you. To serving you and not culture, serving you and not the world, serving you and not what's popular. Thank you for calling us to be a peculiar, odd, <laughs> different kind of people who who stand out in a way that's so wonder, wondrous and glorious that it's it just gives you all the honor, God. Thank you. Mm. Father, 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 forgive us. We pray this all in the mighty name of my Jesus Christ of Nazareth, filled with the Holy Spirit, the Ruha Kadesh, and sealed with the blood of Christ. Yes, and amen. Praise God. Praise to the only living God. <laughs> all right. So until next time, children of the Most High, ever-loving, living God, may God bless you. May God keep you. May we all be forever written in the book of life. Amen. Marie Speaks God's Grace. Website Marie Speaks God's Grace. Live. Marie Speaks God's Grace. Watch so. The Marie Speaks God's Grace. The hand of
the Lord was upon me, and carried me off in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by the round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was coming. As I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews of the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above. There was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. For I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. And he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, and performed it, saith the Lord.